Dear colleagues, dear friends, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here and to share some of my experience. I'm also a big fan, um, a big advocate of this technology, and I thought I'd show you what I've learned over the years and uh, where I apply the system now, and which is in my um, weekly routinely use, and I think it's really making a big difference. It lets us treat patients that are untreatable otherwise. So uh, let me tell you that I think that congenital heart disease patient adults or pediatric cases are very difficult, they're very challenging. They're challenging because they, are, uh, they don't present with normal anatomy. They present with something that has been surgically changed or was already very different from birth. Um, there are locations and properties of the conduction system that might be very, very different um, from normal people. There is frequently um, a block in the normal access to the target chamber that you normally would just go and do, let's say, a typical re-entry around uh, an AV valve. You would just go and have venous access and you just do that, do that re-entry. One of the easiest flutter ablations, obviously, that we can do, but in congenital heart disease, this might actually be a very major challenge because you just can't get into that target chamber so easily. So access is a major issue. The type of arrhythmia also changes. I'm going to focus in my presentation on atrial arrhythmia, but I share exactly um, our chairman's um, attitude that the ventricular cases are for sure I'm going to use the system for. So just because I have all of the things in my fingertip, that already uh, enables me to do it in conventional patients and normal anatomy patients. I'm definitely going to choose the system to also address it in those very complex congenital cases. I'm going to just show you that conventional ablations in congenital heart disease is actually not that successful. This is using this is a cohort that, um, where colleagues used manual ablation with 3D mapping. So if you, know, if you want so state of the art, um, you see different types of congenital heart disease. ASD is probably the, the simplest ones, cytologies, masters, and the univentricular um, patients with Fontan palliations. And I'm just going to highlight this mustard and Fontan um, uh, colors here, green and purple, and you can see acute success is not so bad, about 50-50. gets a bit better, and there's always kind of the honeymoon period. It's probably good enough. Um, but over time, and you see here four years follow-up, 15% for fontans. That's not a great success rate. And these are young patients. We really have to do something for them to make them better. So um, I think serotaxis can actually really help a lot here. So for once, we can overcome the access problems. We can because we do the procedure and we have all of that ready for the operator, we can do that with very little radiation exposure. I think that's another good argument. Um, you can um, choose it to be applied with, for example, the normal sequential mapping system. You could also use simultaneous mapping systems. I'm not going to show you a case here, but we have done this in the Brompton. Um, I've combined this system with the cardio inside super, uh, the body surface mapping system that works beautifully and we've addressed a couple of cases that are unmappable otherwise. And I think it's just, just good to know that you, it's a flexible platform. It, you can actually apply uh, different techniques here. This is how the lab looks in the Brompton, in, the, in London where I practice. Uh, you see the magnets here in the big boxes in park position. You can use that lab as a normal lab, it's just as a cath lab. When we use the system, we swing um, the magnets here um, next to the ch patient's chest and then operate with a remote control system. The operator sits in the control room, doesn't have to be, ex or is therefore not exposed to scattered radiation. Uh, you can take your lead off. Um, I have a nice picture on my iPhone with a little coffee cup from the Lego uh, little display over there. So go by and have a picture. That's exactly what we do. We have our coffee. We have everything else that you want to do in parallel. And I sit here and I interact with all the systems directly. On this big screen, I have, for example, my CARTO or my Cardio Insight mapping system. I have my X-ray. I have all the intercardiac signals. I can pause, measure, do everything. I can interact directly. And I don't have to go through another person where I have to say, measure a little bit more to the left. No, no, stop. Yeah, not on that signal. Just, just so it's all in my hands. I can X-ray from here and I can ablate from here can angulate my C-arm from here, so it's really, if you want, so even a single operator system, although we obviously do it with a, with a large team. This is the concept of the magnetic navigation. You have two permanent magnets, big blocks of heavy material, um, bore, niodime, and iron, glued together. Each one is a ton uh, of weight, and in between that, it forms a relatively uniform magnetic field. It has a certain direction. If you then put a little magnet on the tip of a catheter. In the middle, it needs to be lining 
in the outer magnetic field. And by that changing then the outer magnet's position, you can change the direction of the field and you can change the direction of the catheter. That's exactly what it is. You could put a, the same kind of magnet on the tip of a guide wire and you could do the same thing. Forward, backward would be a mechanical motion. So that's just pushing and pulling on the shaft of the catheter. This is just to illustrate the catheter. By now has four little magnets. <clears throat> has an irrigated tip, is a bipolar catheter, so essentially same dimensions of a normal mapping, sequential mapping um, catheter. Just to show you, it's flexible, it aligns in the magnetic field. If you hold a little handheld magnet, you can just bend this catheter in all kinds of degrees of freedom. And you're not restricted to any curve radius. There is no more pull wire in the catheter, so the catheter is very floppy and very soft. In fact, you can um, you know, when you try to push it against the wall, it will buckle up, it will not, and I only have 15 years of experience with it. I, I have never perforated, so by now I'm very, very relax relaxed about pushing this catheter in all kinds of directions. It, it doesn't go, it will not go, but you can't really do harm. And that actually for congenital heart disease is actually something very, very reassuring. This picture is just to um, make one point, that is that you can loop the catheter around, quite a lot, so you can just, as we're steering the tip of the catheter, not the end, you just steer the tip and the rest of the catheter follows. Um, you can also see that we can do that in patients with implanted devices, it's not a contraindication, you can do it with ICDs or pacemakers, it really is only a matter of program it temporarily such that it can easily um, be dealt with. Uh, every device eventually will go in a magnet mode and you just have to program it such that it doesn't interfere with your case. Now, I will show you two cases, just to illustrate what we're doing. So this is a patient that was uh, referred to me from Paris, France, after having failed a conventional uh, procedure. And you see that we are very careful in congenital heart disease to have a th proper 3D reconstruction of the anatomy we're facing. Now, you can see this is uh, quite a complex case, left atrial isomerism, um, some operations here, we have some Limited, uh, uh, sorry, limited situation with regards to, um, let me just click here and just do it like this. We also have a little side effect that contrast exposure wouldn't be so cool because the patient has a kidney transplant and that's not a cool option obviously. So that was done actually, the 3D reconstruction here is a CMR scan, known contrast. So we just get a beautiful picture and um, we're getting um, uh, very good reconstructions. You can see here the full bidirectional lens here, bilateral lens, and um, planning this procedure was a very key. Uh, venous access would only get you here in the in this green part. This is actually the hepatic veins, and then this is the kind of one part of the atria, the lower, let's say, right atrial question mark um, atrium. In between here, between the purple and the light blue, is a septation. So the surgeons have put. A, a Decron patch here that's very hard to perforate. If you would want it to do this conventionally, I think it would be very hard to do so. So uh, this is to understand the anatomy, plan the procedure, and then um, actually um, go from there. This is to register. You see here two things. You see one reference catheter, a decapolar catheter that I've put via, via venous access in this right atrium, in that part of the right atrium, and we just registered the Carter system to the stereotaxis system. This allows me to use uh, the 3D imaging here as a superimposition of the X-ray screens. And on the first step, I would register that on the surface, on the contour of the heart. You can see that here a little bit, that it actually fits relatively nice. Usually I'd use an RAO and an LAO, but for some reason it, the LAO didn't pitch up here. But you have a nice picture in picture display. The next step would be, the next level of registration is I would reconstruct the aortic arch and then um, by coming from the aortic arch, I have, because the aorta doesn't move that much, I have a very nice fit of the anatomy and I can basically do the procedure um, essentially from that one on the 3D reconstruction. <coughs> and you see that the catheter will always align towards the magnetic field direction, which is here the, the big yellow arrow. And I cross the aortic valve I go through the ventricle, I enter the, the left atrium, or let's say the superior atrium in this case, and I map during ongoing tachycardia, which you probably can see here. Uh, we saw a very nice re-entry around the AV valve, we ablated that, and, and we finally terminated this tachycardia, we prolonged the cycle length. Um, 
initially uh, you probably didn't see that quickly enough. It was a two-to-one conduction with a slower conduction. The patient goes into one con one-to-one -one conduction, so you need to have your anesthetic, anesthetic team to be aware of that because the pressure obviously is going to drop. And then, you know, finally we go and, and do this uh, successfully. We terminate it here now. And um, then the next question is, as you only have that one catheter in, in your target chamber, is the line blocked, yes or no? Termination is not a great endpoint, as we all know. So we need to be sure that the patient doesn't come back, right? It comes all the way from Paris to London, so we better send them back completely cured. Now, the way to do it is to demonstrate bidirectional block. Now, you see that I have, I'm just probably going to just quickly go back to that one quick screen here. This one, oops. You see that I have looped this, my timing reference catheter. And with this, this electrode here is quite close to the line that I've made, which is about here. So by pacing from here, I can demonstrate that the whole activation sequence in the left atrium has to go the other way around. And you can basically have the same, um, same kind of bidirectional block criterion applied. You can pace from both sides, see that the activation changes, and there is a clear D, uh, return. You see the whole procedure, quite long, it took us a minute and 10 seconds for x-ray. And yeah, we were very happy, patient not inducible anymore by burst pace and bidirectional block, documented the patient was sent home by Eurostar back on the second day post-procedure, which I think is very, very nice. And, and I get uh, more referrals from Paris by now, so which is a good thing. <laughs> um, this second case that I wanted to share with you is a patient after mustard repair. Again, um, the anatomy is shown here, quite a large dilated systemic RV. Again, this is a, a quite a nice um, and typical finding. You see here the left ventricle is relatively small, the right ventricle end, this, um, the primary venous atrium is massively dilated. You see that annulus is dilated. This patient has a pacemaker, so this on the left-hand side here is a CT scan. Um, it's just a matter of, of this patient having that. You see that the coronary sinus is sutured to the pulmonary venous atrium, or is left towards the pulmonary venous atrium. Now, uh, that allows us to put a reference catheter only in the, system, in, in the systemic venous atrium. And again, a couple of more issues here for the patient so that we uh, need to make sure that it works well. Same kind of approach, a single diagnostic catheter, arterial access and retrograde approach across <coughs> the aorta. Again, you see the merging over um, the aorta. We have made a nice reconstruction of the aorta. Descending, arch, and ascending. And once we have that, I can actually steer this catheter straight forward through the opening aortic valve. You can see that here. You can see direct navigation. I directly navigate through the RV, directly navigate across the tricuspid valve, and start mapping in ongoing tachycardia. So that is an approach that is very reproducible. I've done it now for all my patients in kind of mass and sending cohort and also the univentricular TCPC um, palliations. Um, it's a very reproducible thing. Um, that works perfect if the patient has a stable tachycardia. Now here you see um, the stepwise approach and we just map with Carter. You steer the tip so you're basically on Carter. You just dr drag the, the arrow and the catheter is going to align it. If you don't have good contact force, if you think you need more stability, you can loop the catheter again, and that um, actually makes it very nice. Um, again, we had a very nice uh, activation sequence here. Uh, map this. And I've seen, actually, in my cohort by now, I've had seen a lot of re-entry around the AV valve. Sometimes you have a scar where the surgeon has chopped off the appendage, so you can, might have a roof scar, and sometimes you have a second substrate that goes around the roof on that scar. And again, it's just sequential mapping as you are used to uh, doing in normal um, arrhythmias. And um, at least in my experience, the mustard cohorts, mustard and sending, have the index arrhythmia, uh, at least, is always in the primary venous atrium. And that approach, you're going to save a transbuffal approach. You're going to be uh, making it very straightforward to do this case. Um, again, we ablate it in the end. We entrain typically, and we ablate in the, in the end, um, and then do the same thing, try to pace from a very proximal electrode close to the line, and then we're, we're going to be fine. Let me just go back once, or oh, it's two slides, just to show you um, the resulting x-ray time. I'm just going to be, I think it's one of the last things here, just to show you 30 seconds. 
for the whole case. That took us two and a half hours. I think that's very, very acceptable. If you think about how many procedures these patients already had in their life, it is, I think, very important to us, and, and it's also good. So let me conclude. I think it's a great tool to do congenital heart disease patients. It's really make it so much easier. Uh, I have not done a transbuffal puncture. The retrograde way um, is very elegant and, and reproducible. It's very easy with implanted devices. It's not the contraindication at all. You can easily deal with that. Image integration is key, and it's very nicely in, uh, enhanced on the system. And you can even do simultaneous mapping. I didn't show that here, but that's also an option uh, that you can do. Let uh, me finally say, and, and that I don't do this on my own. I do it with a lot of colleagues who are excellent um, and help me to do these very complex patients. The Brompton has actually quite a lot of those. And I collaborate with the imaging people, with the anatomists, with a congenital team, with the surgeons, the pacing people. Um, echo is very important to see if we can um, in, in advance see any, any hurdles, let's say, outflow tract obstructions or something like this. And I think it's very important and that overall this collaboration has actually enabled us to be a center of reference then now in, in Europe. We get these kind of patients referred. We take them sometimes by ambulance um, planes and, and, and patients get, get over to us in the Bronfman. We, we fix them and we send them back. And I think it's very gratifying and I'm very proud of, of that team and, that, and the collaboration. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. So we'll probably take one question for um, Dr. Ernst. Any questions from the audience? So Sabine, let me ask you this. Before stereotaxis became a reality, what did you do with all these congenital cases? Were you mostly not really targeting them, managed them with antirhythmic drugs and uh, what? So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I really only started doing congenital cases when I joined the Brompton. So I, I trained in Germany with Achim Hebel. And Achim did a lot of transbuffal punctures and we started doing um, CART at the time in con kind of what I call classical fontans. But we really didn't, I don't recall masters or sendings really be done because it was such a hassle to do the transbuffal mm -hmm. puncture. And when I joined the Brompton, I thought, oh, well, let, why, why don't we try? You know? And I, I just did it because I thought you know, this would be the adequate technology to do it. And it turned out to be extremely helpful. Yep. And you know, we learned from that. And this is now nearly 10 years ago. And, and by now, it's a completely normal thing. In fact, uh, if it's a mustard patient, I might already be um, doing a case and my colleague says, oh, we have another mustard. And they know that I love the case, so I will accept it maybe even doing it on the same day. So it's no longer this big thing that you need to plan for, for weeks. I, I need a 3D scan, that's it. And otherwise, I'm very happy. It's, it's by now no longer a scary procedure. It's just one of the things that we've learned to do well. Yeah, fantastic. I think it, uh, it, it shows how simply a tool could actually increase your clinical yeah. expertise and ability to reach out to more patients.